Will the Oba of Benin's intervention in the political rhetoric in the Ado governorship election bring about peace? And what is organized labor union saying on the new price of petrol? This is Plus Politics, and I am Felicity Ezewike. Thanks for joining us. Days from now, the people of Edo and Ondo states will be heading to the polls to elect their governors. It is a sad narrative that what should be anticipated days for civic rights exercise are often viewed as days to be careful for fear of violence. Just yesterday, the revered Oba of Bedin had to use his royal influence to initiate a peace meeting to obtain commitment from political actors. Joining us to speak on this and other political developments across the country, including his home country, uh, home state, I beg your pardon, is a former governorship candidate of the APC in River State, Dr. Dakuku Peterside. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, let's start with the Obers Peace Pact. This is not the first time when elections are set, we get you know, parties committing to peaceful exercise, but that doesn't seem to have much effect in the actual process. What's your take on the latest with the position of the Oba be of influence this time? Thank you very much. It's a very good move that the Oba using his royal influence in Benin, the Oba is revered to summon the two leading candidates, there are other candidates in that election, to the palace and extracted a firm commitment from them um, that they will be ugly and that the elections will not be characterized by violence. But speaking from the benefit of hindsight and experience, in 2015 elections in River State, where I was an, a major actor and candidate of the All Progressives Congress. I recall that the American embassy in Nigeria had two meetings with those of us who were leading candidates at the time and extracted a commitment. We actually signed an undertaking. Then we had the General Abubakar and Bishop Mati Kuka led National Peace Committee hold meetings with us and extracted the same commitment. And yet, of course, it is recorded that the River State governorship election of, 19, of 2015 remains the most violent and most controversial governorship election in the history of Nigeria. After they obtained or extracted those commitments from us, I hope a door will not go the way of rivers. We certainly hope that will not be the case. I believe that the gentlemen who are the leading candidates in a door understands the implication of a violent election. Um, the elections will be over, but it scares will remain for a very long time to come. And the people of Edo, like I had always said, will, be, will bear the ultimate brunt. Not those who engineer the violence, not those who are imported to, to perpetrate the violence. The people right. of Edo, whom they seek to govern, will bear the brunt of whatever violence that they cause in course of this election. Well, the, the point of this conversation uh, primarily is to try and see how we can you know, engender a more positive approach, you know, not violence prone. So let's take a look. You've written uh, severally, uh, but this time there was one and part one and part two. You shared concerns. At first, I told you before we started that the first part scared me, and then the second part was more progressive in suggestions on uh, what to do. But there's, I want us to start from there, the, the, the progressive part of uh, the conversation. Are you still conflicted? You talked about a conversation you had with one U.S. Uh, consul uh, way back, and he expressed very similar sentiments you expressed just now, uh, but you felt differently that the people of the Niger Delta are developing democratically and they are more aware. Are you still conflicted about that, or you still hold that position that democracy is thriving? I, I hold a firm position that there's been a lot of improvement in terms of deepening of democracy in the Niger Delta. Uh, we're beginning to appreciate that violence does no one any good, and that ultimately we lose whenever there's a violent election. And that is why, um, if you notice, the elections that took place in Bayasa, it was an off-season election. 
it wasn't as violent as was anticipated. Um, it was a relatively and comparatively free and fair election, um, even though the candidate who won in that election was ultimately was in, in, in finally disqualified uh, by Supreme Court by virtue of the fact that um, he questioned the credentials of his deputy or his running mate. But at least he had semblance of a free and fair election. It was relatively free and fair. And if you look at all the other off-season, uh, or what they call standalone elections, that took place in the Niger Delta area, and the Niger Delta state, or South-South states, depending on which uh, one you choose, um, all of them were relatively peaceful. So I am optimistic that, yes, the science coming out from a do is not good, but um, I am very optimistic that the people will have learned lessons from what happened to others, and that they will choose the path of honor, the path of peace, uh, the path that will leave Nigeria and say, indeed, Edo has done it. Nigeria yeah, you, you, you did say in your piece that we have a lot of work uh, to do, and you highlighted Absolutely. five critical areas. Let's take on two um, for now. You talked about the need to curb violence and, of course, the role of our security agencies during this election. Um, what actions are you expecting to see for us to have um, people who are confident enough in their security to go out to the polls and vote? Well, three important actions, and I'll just go straight. The first one is neutrality of the security agents, whether it's the Nigerian police, Department of State Security Service, or even the military, if they have to deploy the military, if they have to deploy the military in that election. Their neutrality is very important. Now, aside from neutrality, how do you even know that these guys are going to be neutral? The earlier they begin engagement with all the political parties, and when I say engagement, not just INEC, get the security people involved in that engagement. Let them know that, yes, you may not tell them your strategy or the specific tactics, but let them know that the security is there to serve the interest of everybody, to protect the interest of all major actors in the political process. Now, that engenders some level of confidence in the process. So they need to hold that con uh, con uh, engagement continuously. That's one. Now, two is the fact that it is possible that you have security agents that are neutral, but you bring talks, you know, you bring these talks into the system, and they have two targets. One is the security agencies. Nobody's going to, the security agencies are not going to allow themselves to be killed because they are there to maintain peace. They will put up some self-defense. Now, how do we reduce the level of toggery? Ultimately, the way to reduce the le level of toggery is electronic voting. But we're not there. It will still take, first, the amendment of laws. It will take uh, to put the mechanics in place, meaning they put the technology in place and all of that. Still some ways off. So, yeah, so we're not going to talk about that. Let's talk about the things that can be done immediately. And so, now, in the issue of toggery, now, the, the police and security forces need to be proactive. You don't wait for it to occur. And so they will need to come in into a door days before the time, begin to do some intelligence work, now begin to also engage the politicians. Uh, now, let the politicians understand that if we import talks, we can leak the talks to you, and ultimately you will suffer some consequences for it. And the way it's done is simple. You know, there are no talks that can come into a system that are not invited by one group or the other. And they can be linked. Because whenever you have 50 persons, there is no way you will not know where they're coming from and who is importing them. Except if our intelligence network is not proactive. If it is proactive, of course, they will, they will pick the signals and they can contain it early enough. So that's another thing they need to do. Now, the third is the fact that INEC itself needs to show reasonable degree of neutrality. And I have said that in an off-season election, don't go and recruit, recruit ad hoc personnel who are card carrying members of any of the political parties. Very often, it sends wrong signal, and these will prepare to defend themselves. INEC has enough persons all over the country. So you, you gather your people from all the states of the country, because it's a standalone election, they do. So you get either your electoral officers, assistant electoral officers from all over the country. Let them be the pooling um, presiding officers, pooling clerks, and everything. You have them within INEC. And the staff who work in INEC are reasonably Neutral. Not that they are neutral completely, but they are reasonably neutral. They are likely right. to be neutral because they have a job to protect. 
Yes, indeed. Uh, but let, let's look at another issue. Um, not just worrying a lot of persons, not just you, the language that is being used oh, in the campaign as we, we have them now. And it seems to be a reoccurring decimal when elections are closed by. It, it distracts from the real issues and we look at mudslinging, uh, misinformation and all of that. So I'm, I'm going to ask you from the perspective, the perception of um, a solution now. What is our role as the people and INEC as an umpire to redirect the language of the campaign we have now to something more substantial that will benefit the people of Edo State? Again, I take you to three dimensions. And I'll start with the ultimate solution. The ultimate solution, I'm aware that there's a piece of legislation before the National Assembly, the Electoral Offenses Commission Bill, which unfortunately has not been passed to you now. That bill has been around for some time, right from my days in the National Assembly, and why it's not been passed, I cannot explain. For me, that would be the ultimate uh, this thing. You will now have a watchdog who will monitor campaigns, who can prosecute, and of course, ensure that people get punished for use of foul language, for mudslinging, and all such things that, are, that constitute electoral offenses that are clearly captured in uh, our law books or in the rules. That year, you know, um, in addition, you know, to even strengthen uh, the hand of the law, the arm of the law concerning this issue of mudslinging, false information, rumor mongering, is that there is a provision in the EFCC Act, there's a provision in both the ICPC Act and all of those things for false information. But nobody, and I don't blame INEC, their hands are full. Nobody has bothered to track uh, campaign language, to punish people or to prosecute people that runs foul of the provisions of the law. That's ultimate. That's not what can be achieved in, in the next yes. two weeks before a yes. do elections. Now, in the interim, now the media has a role to play. INEC too has some minimal role to play. Now, the media, again, um, heightens tension in the place by the kind of reports they make. So let's appeal to our friends in the media to tone down their language. And please, um, it's high time we don't report candidates that are very uncooked and uncivil in their conduct. The only thing is highlight the fact that they are uncivil and uncooked, and that's not acceptable in a civilized society. All right. The media needs to do that. Now, the candidates themselves. Now, if INEC engages with the candidates, they need to make them understand the provisions of the law concerning muslinging, uh, false information, rumor, mongering. INEC has some role to play in the interim. Okay. For, for today, or today as, as today, the law empowers INEC to monitor the language of campaign, to punish or prosecute those it's just that we, we keep excluding yeah, Alex because their hands yeah, are full. Their, their, their hands are really full. There are so many issues we need to talk on uh, when it comes to mm -hmm. the election. Uh, we need to manage time so we can also talk about uh, politics in your state. But before we get to that, card readers and malfunctioning uh, was something that was very noted in the last um, elections. Um, do you think INEC has that in check now? Well, I, I don't work for INEC. I, don't, I won't hold brief for INEC. But just like you said, you are clearly agree and identify with that, that in the past two elections, they tried it in 2015 general elections, they tried it in 2019 general elections, they tried it in a number of off-season elections. And I must say that the report coming from the field is not heartwarming. Um, there is a series of complaints that instead of card reader being a facilitator of free and fair election, card reader has contributed to the problems we encounter in course of trying to conduct the election. And ordinarily, card reader should contribute Excuse me, especially in the, in the accreditation process. But that's not the position. I believe that INEC should have learned a few lessons, having uh, used card reader a number of times. They should improve uh, on the technology of the card reader. That's not, it's not record, rocket science. I'm a bit surprised. You know, that's technology that's been in existence in many other places. Now, it, you did say this is like a test for what we are going to see in, in the coming uh, elections. Yeah, but there's some but let's... additional thing INEC has said. They said they, they're going to introduce what is called zip. Z file. Now, the Z file um, will enhance the work of the candidate and is able to convey results immediately after an election to various centers of interest. I hope that and gets technology right, gets the Z file right, and let them be a bit more open 
uh, and transparent about it. Let right. people let people see the back end of the card reader or the server. Let people see the back end of the Z file. If Z file people, just one or two persons have access to it, and they can tell us stories. But if more persons have access to it, let the parties be represented at the various um, centers, back end centers, so that the parties can see the results coming in, can see that INET is actually using the Z file. You know, I, oh, the acquisition, as you do acquisition, let them see the results coming from the back end. That way, nobody will play games. That will enhance confidence in the system. And indeed, we will have a free and fair election. You know, let's, the truth, let's, let's. why there's usually violence and dispute is when the elections are opaque, not transparent, then people resort to all sorts of these things. Uh, INEC needs to be a bit more um, transparent open. with information. Okay, let's, let's go to your state uh, for now. Your party, uh, the APC, has seen a real huge number of defection uh, lately, and there is this crisis, seeming crisis of confidence between the state APC and the national body. What do you think is responsible for this? Well, I like to, they, they, you've just said two things. One is that my party in River State has seen some defection in recent times. And there appears to be some crisis of confidence. Then at the national level, there also appears to be some uh, crisis of confidence. So three things. It is true, you're very correct, and that I'll be living in self-denial to, de to say that my party has not experienced uh, any form of uh, defection um, in recent times. But I want us to get three things clear, and I'll make it very, very clear. The provisions of our party constitution, uh, the, our party constitution makes provisions for anybody who wants to defect, to defect to another party. That's one. And so it is their right, which nobody can deny them, if they choose to defect uh, from my party to another party. The second important point to make is that the sources uh, and the popularity of the party in River State is not built around individuals. It's built around principles, it's built around values, it's built around what we believe. Now, APC in River State is a movement. It's unfortunate that for some reasons, you know, maybe external interference, some um, self-inflicted, and let me not pretend about that, some self-inflicted, some uh, external interference, some uh, reasons of uh, positions of the judiciary. We are not able to present candidates in the last election. So that's another reason why you, you can see so, what you've some seen. Some would actually argue with you. I, I didn't want to interrupt you when you said um, it's a party uh, based on ideology and all of that, because a lot of persons would say there doesn't seem to be a coordinated agenda from the APC, not just from River State, but nationally. Um, at one point, there, there was a conversation. Uh, let me talk about the very basic uh, the conversation around restructuring. We understand there was a, um, a committee set up to look at that, but it seems that matters have pushed that aside. And then you also see people moving from party to party. I, I, if I may ask, aren't you aggrieved uh, with your party? Are you aggrieved because of the principles that are not being followed, or are you aggrieved because of your own personal interest? Yeah, two things. You know, I, I have not landed on River State. I simply said the APC in River State is a movement not built around an individual. Yes. And so when individuals leave, it, it may not affect the party. When one or two individuals leave, it's a movement. And we we'll respect their right to choose whichever party to belong at any point in time. There's nothing anybody can do about that. Now, but the movement is, 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 is two ways. There are many members of the PDP moving to APC, as the same way members of APC are moving to PDP. I also agree with you that parties in Nigeria are not firmly established on ideological principles. They're simply con platforms of convenience for people to go and aspire for power. And that's why people can go to bed at night, being a member of one political party, oh, wake, wake up, up the know. next morning, <laughs> member of another political party. Um, I, I wish we had so much time. I've just been whispered that we have less than four minutes on the program. So um, on this uh, segment, actually, I, I would, uh, there are efforts, apparently, to unify the party. Caretaker committees have been set up. Um, are you satisfied with the work that they've been doing? Well, clearly, I am satisfied more? with the way the caretaker committee at the national level has started. Uh, they seem to be doing um, a lot of good work. Uh, it will naturally take time for results to begin to manifest. Nobody expects a result will manifest immediately. But taking the very first few right steps, uh, we want to encourage them. Ultimately, 
they will conduct a national convention, elect new set of executives. But uh, the Governor Buni led Keter committee has taken very critical and strategic steps towards resolving some of our internal contradictions and challenges that we face as a party. At the state level, at the river state level, um, there is a judicial process going on. And like I've always said, judicial process in itself cannot achieve peace in the party. I know that there are conversations going on too, in addition to a judicial process. We say, listen, a judicial process is going on. Let people be talking across board and say, listen, what are we fighting for? Look at the level of bad governance in River State. Look at the level of lack of focus by the government in River State. The government in River State is clearly against the people of River State. Uh, and that, that somebody might not agree with you, but that is your unique opinion. Let, let me ask you, you, I mean, you, you look like you are happy with the efforts at making peace. At the national or level. Not at the national level, not at the, so are you thinking maybe of changing your uh, platform as well? No, 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 no. That cannot come under consideration. At least, not for now. There's <laughs> okay, there is a possibility that could happen. No, you know, in life, you can never say never. There mm. are many reasons why you can never say never. I used to be a member of the PDP, and um, at some point, I just felt that the party no longer represents what I believe in. And I defected on the floor of the National Assembly to APC. So in life, you can never really say never. But not in the foreseeable future, future. do I see myself leaving the APC. Will you run for a candidate again in two seconds, if you can? Will you run as a candidate again? Is it not too far? <laughs> it's not too far. With COVID, you can the stop first please. thing is that everybody wants to be alive, want to be healthy and active. Then you cannot make a decision whether to run for election or not. All right, in Pretty 30 seconds now, I'm sorry I'm rushing you, but in 30 seconds now, um, how important it is, is it that we must get the Edo and Ondo elections right this time? Oh, um, it is very imperative that we get a do and undo right. If not, Nigerians will not believe in democracy. Nigerians will not have confidence in the electoral process. And that will be the beginning of demise of democracy. And of course, it will engender more, more, more violence. And of course, will lead to apathy. Nigerians won't come out to vote. In addition, then Nigerians won't trust the electoral process as the best way to choose their leaders. They will resort to self-help and other means. That will not be good for our country. That will be a journey to anarchy. That, indeed, will be a replay of the Malian situation. And I so pray we don't have a choice. We have to get it we right. We just have to get it right. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Your time is appreciated. Thank you very much, too. And thank you for listening. All right. Thank you for staying with us thus far. The PP... PRA on Tuesday announced a new price of petrol to about 160 Naira. We'll talk about that after this break. Stay with us.